Well, good afternoon. It's nice to see all of you. It's nice to be here with you physically as opposed to just virtually. <laughs> How many of you saw my, uh, my video this morning? You know, the, the, it doesn't do you justice because th this is the same suit I was wearing. I don't know if you could tell, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm sorry I did have to miss in the morning, but uh, I'm here this afternoon and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the conference. For those of you that were here this morning, how's it been so far? Can I hear it from you? It's good, right? I have to tell you, there's a couple of things that I'm very impressed with. One is, as we were looking through the registrations of folks that, are, that have registered for it, uh, I was very pleased to see that it's not just the IT folks that get it. It's not just IT folks that are in here, but we also have a lot of folks with, uh, with uh, job classifications and job titles that indicate they're from the program side of the house. So if you're from the program side of the house, could you please raise your hand? We'd like to acknowledge you. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> I have to tell you, I'm really also glad that we have the opportunity to recognize uh, some of the teams and some of the individuals that have been leaders in California in the use of big data and data analytics as a means of improving the way government operates. Uh, one of the things that I hope that all of you do while you're here is look, take a look around, see who else is here, see who else is doing things using big data and, do, and data analytics and start to network with them, pick their brains, especially those folks that uh, we're going to be talking about later on as we do our awards and those, those folks that are nominated. Uh, so make sure that you get a chance to network during the breaks and, and at every opportunity that you have. Before I introduce our, uh, our keynote or for lunch, I wanted to, to just share a couple of, of items of information from my shop. Uh, one, because I'm very proud of the fact, that, uh, but we recently appointed two new chief deputy directors at the Department of Technology, as well as our director of OTEC, the, our Office of Technology Services. I have seen them running around earlier, so uh, if you get a chance, get up and stop by mm -hmm. and shake their hands for uh, Ron, Ron Hughes, who's chief deputy of operations, Andrea Roman, who's chief deputy over policy, and for Davud Godes, who's chief deputy at, uh, who's director of OTEC. So, how about a nice round of applause for those folks? <clears throat> you know, part of the reason why we've got new, new folks in those roles is because we have had some departures. So, you all remember uh, Anna, Anna Brannon and Paul Benedetto that left and went off to the private sector. Uh, recently, we had Carrie Gutierrez, the head of our, our project oversight division also went off to the private sector. And then just this morning, we heard the announcement about Russ Guarna, our, our head of uh, IT procurement over at my department, who has also gone off and left us into the private sector. So I want to congratulate them on their opportunities. And then, uh, and I, yeah, please <laughs> help me congratulate them. <clears throat> By the way, if you are from the private sector, can I, can I just see your hands? I do have a message and a request for you. Stop it. <laughs> Stop taking my people. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know, it's, I know that those folks, even though they are going off to work in the private sector, still are, are state employees at heart, and I know that they're going to continue to work with us in partnership to make California great. So speaking of the private sector, I wanted to, to just uh, share a couple of things with you about our, our uh, keynote speaker. I know that for those of us in government, we have this idea and this impression that the private sector always has things together, that they're on the leading edge, that everything works excellently in, in terms of the way that they go about doing things that are innovative or embracing new technologies. Uh, with companies like Intel in particular, I always picture them as being on the cutting edge of technology and in, in not only implementing technology and going out and discovering and developing uh, technology, but also using it in an innovative way. Well, after, after talking to our speaker last night, I came to realize that large organizations, whether they're on the private sector side or on the public sector side, often face very similar issues. So as an example, we are talking about Intel's pursuit of big data and, and the promises and the potential that it promised. Uh, and I discovered a couple of interesting things about Intel. One, like government, they also have a bureaucracy that has to be navigated. They have um, unlike government, no, I actually like government too, but they also have folks that sometimes resist change. So that has to be overcome. They have to get budget approval. And before they go off on an initiative, they have to do a lot of planning. So all similar challenges that we face in the public sector. Well, Intel 
appointed a person that who's responsible for developing those plans and then implementing them, for navigating that bureaucracy and for getting people to change. And that's A.J. Chandramuli. A.J. has a title of Big Data Domain Owner at Intel IT. He has over 13 years of experience in the technology arena and more than 10 years of that over at Intel Corporation. <clears throat> While there, AJ, AJ has held a variety of IT software and hardware engineering positions and at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory as well. He's spoken at numerous forums worldwide, including Computer World's Storage Networking World and the National Defense Industrial Association's annual event. In addition, AJ has been a highly regarded expert in the field of big data, in, <clears throat> in the field of big data, cloud computing, and data center management. AJ's current role as big data domain owner is to share Intel's, uh, Intel IT's big data best practices with the senior peers in, in the IT arena across the country. I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from him, so please help me in welcoming AJ to the stage. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Carlos, for that great introduction. So I'm going to dive right in. I have about 45 minutes. And um, the purpose of this talk, I really want to accomplish three things. You know, it's great, like Carlos was mentioning, that we have a mix of folks in the audience, about half program operations managers and, and half IT. And I think and I hope that this presentation will speak and resonate with both sides, especially as we see these roles converging, where IT folks now are being asked more than ever to be a part of the business, to influence the business, and add value to the business. And business folks have to become more knowledgeable and aware of all the solutions and tools that are out there to help them deliver on their business and operations goals. So three things. First, I want to talk about the impact and value of big data across the industry, whether you're private sector or public sector. Uh, no matter what the vertical is, whether you're in retail or social networking or pharmaceutical or oil and gas, big data is here and it's had an impact across all industries, all sectors. From there, I want to talk specifically about what Intel IT is doing and how we're harnessing big data and how we're trying to use it to help us improve our business, our operations, and deliver competitive advantage to our business. And then lastly, the call to action. You know, I want to hopefully maybe um, inspire and, and offer some ideas and suggestions of how the public sector, the state of California, the folks in this room can also apply big data, you know, share our journey, and maybe you guys can learn from that, maybe even apply some of that or, or do things differently. So that's the agenda. So let me start here. Um, you know, this is one slide to really um, that captures you know, big data and, and what it means. Everything from, you know, we all know and use Facebook, Twitter, you know, YouTube, the amount of pictures that we're uploading on YouTube and Instagram, the, you know, Twitter, the tweets, all of this is a massive amount of data that we are collectively generating. And it's not just human-generated data, it's also machine-generated data as well. We have computers, sensors on, on the edges of networks that are capturing data, uh, images and video, and analyzing that data. Um, web logs that are being um, generated daily, hourly, um, on the network and on the edges as well. So all of this data is being generated every day. Now the challenge or the question is, you know, what do we do with it? How can we take advantage of it? And that's the question that a lot of folks in this room and you know, across the world are trying to, to figure out. So for me, you take that complicated slide, right, with all the, all the, the various factors and variables associated with big data, and you boil it down to this. You know, on one side, you've got the asset, the big data, the, the tweets, the, the Facebook likes, um, YouTube videos, Instagram pictures, and then on the other side, you've got the analytics. You've got the tools that allow you to take all of this unstructured data and, and 
and store it in a meaningful way and analyze it. And then, you know, if you can, to then combine that with your traditional structured data to really uncover true insight to help your business. And that intersection, the intersection of unstructured data with structured data, is where the insight and value lies. So let me start by kind of level setting and defining big data so we're on the same page. Um, I don't know, probably a lot of folks, have you guys heard about the, the three or four or five Vs of big data? How many folks have, show of hands, have, have heard of those? Yeah. It seems like, you know, every couple of days there's another V added on and, you know, before you know there's, you know, we'll have about 18 Vs to describe big data. But, but I think these four here um, really capture it. So, so the first one, volume, you know, pretty straightforward. You know, like I said, all this data being generated by machines and humans and even enterprises um, is driving massive scale and volume. And the ability to manage all this data is, is a key challenge. That's number one. Number two, the velocity of the data that's being generated. Um, the ability to do real-time analysis. You know, imagine going to Google or Amazon or Netflix, right, and, and you're searching for something. Imagine having to wait for a response back. You know, we're so used to these sub-second, you know, latencies that if it took anything longer than that, we probably would stop using it. So velocity is a key attribute of big data. The variety of the data. Um, you know, I mentioned unstructured data and structured data. You know, the key difference between those two things is, you know, basically unstructured data is anything that can't fit neatly into traditional relational databases that we've all used before in the past and have grown accustomed to. So how do we manage and store that unstructured data in a meaningful way? And then, you know, the, again, I want to emphasize this, the key challenge then is then combining that and merging that with structured data, which we have been storing for a long time to get to those insights. And then lastly, variability. Um, you know, predictive analytics is, a, you know, that's kind of the, the holy grail, right? Being able to predict the future um, through things like um, big data analytics and then being able to act on that future to change outcomes. Um, and another aspect of variability too is, you know, is that one size doesn't fit all. You know, one of the things that we've learned at Intel IT is that you know, we went from this centralized data management, this one-size-fits-all enterprise data warehouse. Um, you know, before, you know, big data was, was a buzzword in the industry. And we quickly realized that with the explosion of data that even we at Intel IT were, were grappling with and facing, one, it just wasn't cost-effective to put all of that data in an enterprise data warehouse. So there's the cost side of it, right, that motivates IT, as we're always trying to cut costs. But then there was the business side of it, which was, you know, how do we get the right data in the right form in the right place at the right time to the right end user? And that required us to change our approach and to expand out our data warehouse strategy so that we had multiple containers and not just this one size fits all strategy and approach. So like I mentioned, you know, some of the things that are driving big data, I talked about the machine-generated data, right? Whether it's web logs or sensors or cameras. You've got the human-generated data, which all of us in this room are a part of. We're always taking pictures and uploading pictures and sharing pictures. And then you've got business-generated data, enterprises like Intel and other um, companies out there. So what I wanted to do here was then kind of, you know, as I was preparing this talk, how do I apply this to, say, the public sector and the state of California. And so, you know, with big data, there's different approaches to tackle this, right? You've, you can use a scale-up approach, you know, think supercomputers, right? And supercomputers are restricted to, you know, entities that have the resources that can afford these. The federal government, national labs, Department of Defense. These are all the kinds of institutions, um, research labs that can, you know, really afford to to invest in these in the supercomputers and tackle big data that way. But really, the, the beauty of big data is, is the democratization of data. Now, you don't need to have a supercomputer to be able to harness the power of big data. You can now, through a distributed, massively parallel framework, you can use things, you can split up workloads um, through the, the Hadoop open source framework and still be able to take advantage of analyzing huge quantities of data. And so I was thinking of, about various departments of the state, like the Department of Corrections and, and Justice and Health Services and water resources that could um, take advantage of this distributed approach. 
And lastly, we also have a lot, we're also seeing a lot of computing at the edge. Um, you guys might have heard of this new term called the Internet of Things, right? Where we're trying now to make every device um, out there smart, really, being, having it, allowing it to have the ability to compute and communicate so that it's connected. And so you can have devices communicating with each other. And as these devices are able to, to compute on the edge, it also provides new value. So, you know, departments like employee um, development, the Franchise Tax Board, DMV, uh, CHP, Caltrans Social Services, these are all departments that I thought um, could also benefit from this kind of edge um, compute. So there really is you know, opportunities um, for the state of California to take advantage of here. Um, it's not just, it's not anymore. The point here is, you know, big data is not anymore for just a few institutions that have access to supercomputing. Um, now all of us can, can harness and, and take advantage of this. So what I wanted to do here is kind of talk about the progression of big data. You know, why big data now? What does it really mean? And then, of course, the role of data scientists and, um, you know, where data scientists can play in this whole progression. You know, we heard Pam Lane talk earlier this morning about data scientists and that role, and, and I agree with her. I'll expand a little bit on what she was saying. But, you know, it starts with descriptive analytics, and that's basically understanding what happened, right? And then from there, it's diagnostic analytics to be able to understand why it happened. So this, is, this was traditional BI, if you will, traditional business intelligence that we have been doing since, you know, the beginning of commerce, right? Being able to understand what happened and why it happened. Where big data plays, um, you know, especially, is starting with predictive analytics. And that's being able to, you know, go from what happened and why it happened to being able to predict what will happen. And then when you know what will happen, to then understand or have meaningful actions that you can take on that data. So what should you do about it? And then, of course, there are things like preemptive analytics, which is what can I do more? So for you know, example, I'm, you know, I'm sure we've all been out on the web or we're you know, maybe surfing something or thinking about buying something, and we'll get intercepted by um, you know, a message that says, hey, would you like to chat with an agent? You know, all of that stuff is, you know, is brought to you or is allowed by big data because companies are now able to really understand and analyze the purchasing behavior of folks, be, being able to understand you know, when do consumers tend to move away from, you know, get distracted or not click on that purchase button. And as a result, to try to intercept folks at that time to get people to actually purchase, purchase sooner, or maybe even purchase more. So that's the progression of big data. And that's, and that's you know, one key aspect of where the value lies. Being able to predict what will happen, what you should do about it, and how you can even change those outcomes. So, you know, this slide here, just highlighting a couple of industries, right? Data science today is what computer science was, you know, a couple of decades ago. So it is here to stay. We see, you know, whether you're in the airline, the, the industry, Southwest has taken advantage of it, and, and Target has taken advantage of it as well um, through a very famous example. Um, how many folks here are familiar with this, um, the pregnancy controversy with the Target stores? Anybody show of hands? Okay. So a couple of people. Um, but basically, what, what happened here was, you know, so retailers had done a pretty exhaustive study and on purchasing behaviors and patterns of consumers. And what they found was, just from a behavioral point of view, when it came to purchasing mundane things like toothpaste or soap, things like that, consumers are very habitual, right? We don't think about what we're doing. We just buy what we've always bought. And this was a challenge for marketers because, you know, how do they get you to change brands or to maybe get you to buy, um, you know, the slightly more expensive version of a brand, et cetera. No matter what they tried, right, um, you know, consumers would just keep buying what they were going to buy. Unless there was a major life event, right, unless maybe you graduated from college, for example, or got a new job or bought a new house or, or you know, got married or, or had a kid, those key points in a person's life you know, for, for whatever reason, they found that, that that's kind of a point, a trigger point that changes these traditional habitual purchases before. And so Target, knowing this, you know, they wanted to take advantage of this. So, or, yeah, take advantage of, of this phenomenon. And what they noticed was, um, you know, they felt like 
if a woman goes into a store when she's pregnant, they've already, you know, they've lost the opportunity. So what they were trying to do is market to women even before they knew they were pregnant. So they knew that women tended to buy things like unscented lotions, right? Large quantities of calcium, magnesium, and zinc, unscented soaps, large bags of cotton balls, et cetera. And so as a result of these purchasing behaviors, they were able to tell when someone was pregnant even before they might have known. Yeah, and so what happened was Target started, I think this was in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, they started sending these coupons, pregnancy-related coupons, to a teenage girl. And uh, the father was livid. You know, he, 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 he was getting these pregnancy-related coupons in the mail. You know, one day, he, you, know, physical, you know, he clutched them, went to the store, Target store, and demanded to speak to the manager and was saying, what are you doing? You know, why are you, you know, encouraging my teenage daughter to get pregnant? Um, but he later found out that she was, in fact, pregnant. <laughs> And um, he actually had to, you know, went back to the store and apologized later on. But, you know, again, you know, the, the power of big data and, you know, what it can do here. So now I want to kind of dive in um, a little bit to specifics, right? So these are all, you know, fun, interesting, you know, depending on if you're in the situation or not. I don't know how fun it is, but, um, you know, stories. But how do people do this? How do Target do this? How did Southwest Airlines, how does Intel and other enterprises, Google, Net, um, Netflix and Facebook do these things. They do it through things like machine learning, through um, unsupervised pattern mining, numerical analysis, and data processing. And underneath those, you've got a variety of techniques, things like regression, classification, clustering. And you know, there are a couple examples around um, each of these to, you know, to help illustrate the point. I think examples are better than um, just kind of going through what each of these are. And, you know, whether it's fraud detection, right, being able to use things like classification to identify patterns, anomalies, to find fraud. Um, you can use clustering to use for recommendations. You know, how, does, how is Netflix so good at being able to recommend, you know, movies to us? And, and even Amazon. I mean, I was just um, listening on the radio on the way down here. Amazon now wants to be able to um, actually ship you items before you actually purchase them. So, you know, they're, you know they're, they, just a couple weeks ago, it was about using drones to deliver to your doorstep, and now they want to um, ship stuff before you actually buy it. You know, based on things like, you know, were you, was your mouse hovering over something? Um, you know, did you have something in your wish list? Things like that. So, you know, some other examples here. And, you know, we see, you know, so you guys may not be familiar with the terms, you know, in the previous slide, but, you know, here's some examples of where we see all these techniques at work, at play, behind the scenes, every day, right? Whether you're going to google.com and you're looking at classifications and clustering um, schemes on Amazon, right? You're seeing context and content, context aware content recommendations and collaborative recommendations. You know, such and such person that's similar to you, that's like you, also purchased this. Uh, you might be interested also. And even in things like, you know, law libraries and searching, um, for content and, and even being able to do things like deduplication. You know, we take for granted things that now we're so overwhelmed with data, you know, how do we get down to something that's manageable? So these are, you know, examples of all those techniques at play. Um, here are some more um, examples that I mentioned. Um, you know, whether, you know, this example here on the top left, I'm gonna dive into, that's one that we've done here at Intel IT. It was our incident predictability um, case study and um, I want to spend some time describing that, um, not right here in a couple of slides, because it's similar to what a lot of companies out there are trying to do, and even what um, the state of California is trying to do. You know, I heard a little bit, I saw similarities in what Karen Johnson was describing earlier this morning in, in her keynote and a conversation that we had last night at dinner. So, you know, like Carlos was mentioning too in his introduction, you know, there are similarities, right? Uh, you know, we, we know the differences between public sector and private sector, but there are similarities as well. Um, and, and not in a bad way, in a good way. So, you know, we can share some of those learnings with, with you folks. So, you know, a triangle um, graph matrices, graph search is another new area, emerging area in um, big data analytics. I'll talk about that, how that's being applied. You know, we know how graph analytics is being applied to, you know, things like Facebook, social networks, and LinkedIn, but also seeing it applied to healthcare, and that's, you know, where it can be applicable also to, um, the public sector and federal, state, local governments. You know, fraud detection on credit card statements, 
Um, and I mentioned also, you know, the Internet of Things, right? Um, now that devices can communicate with each other, you know, how do you harness all that and, t and use that data to help augment s some of your analysis and in the quest to find value? So just to, um, you know, I mentioned regression analysis earlier. I mean, just some examples to um, illustrate, you know, what these things are. But, you know, if you're the state government or federal, you know, population prediction is something that's important. You know, rainfall, you know, here in California, we're currently going through a drought. I think it's, what now, 46 days straight, no rainfall here in the rainy season. So how can we get ahead of that? How can we use things like big data regression um, analysis, predictive modeling to, you know, get ahead of these things so that we can prepare um, for these, these sorts of things when they do happen. And even population growth, it's not just as simple as, you know, drawing a line out, right, and extrapolating. Looking at all kinds of factors, right, like education, um, male to female children ratios, um, all these factors are going into creating more and more accurate predictions of what will happen so that you can take preemptive action. You know, another example, you know, Google's done a great job of this. Um, you know, when they went, before, you know, you would type in a, a query into the Google search box and it would, it would come back with a bunch of answers. And now, even before you finish typing in um, a word, Google is already suggesting things that you may be interested in. And sometimes it's a little bit funny here. Um, you know, the, you, know, you can see the example here, are, are men necessary? This, the second one and the second to last one I thought were, were, were funny. I mean, do women really Google that? Are men necessary? Maybe, uh, maybe us guys should get our acts together. Um, but, you know, so, like, you know, the, so the first two examples, right, Brittany blank, right, you can kind of guess what that next word is going to be, right? Those are kind of obvious ways, or Justin blank. Um, you know, you can probably guess what Google is going to come up with. But, you know, for the state of California, right, I mean, could, could we here adopt something similar? And, for instance, water, um, if someone is to go in and type in water to the state of California, um, you know, webpage, maybe it's water conservation, right? Maybe we want to suggest and proactively get folks who voluntarily want to conserve water. You know, renew driver's license, right? The, the, you know, the, the second example. So applying these kinds of things that what Google is doing, to, you know, to, to the state of California, not just to do it for the sake of doing it, or not just to copy or mimic it, but really going back to doing it because it'll help deliver better services to the constituents of California. Um, so that's important. So when I look at the state of California and how can big data benefit the state of California, you know, for me, I can see two ways, there's probably more, um, but the two big ways is one, improving constituent experiences, delivering better services to constituents, and then, you know, streamlining government operations. How do we increase the efficiency um, of operations? So here's, what was, here's what I was mentioning earlier, um, the application of graph search to, um, to medical care. And maybe I should just pause here a little bit and quickly describe how many folks are familiar with graph analytics and graph search? Okay, just a couple. Um, but basically, this is a new way of visualizing data, right? And, and this type of thing is very applicable when the links between nodes are actually more important than the data that resides within a node. And that's when you start to get some new value, new ways of looking at things. And so here, um, the, the purpose of this, you know, so through things like LinkedIn and Facebook, we all know how, you know, you can imagine how graph search works, right? You know, who's friends with who, who's connected to who, eh, et cetera. But with medicine, for instance, like what, p through things like graph search, people have noticed, you know, a correlation between certain genetic disorders, genetic disorders and actual <coughs> diseases or ailments. And that can help improve healthcare, help focus R&D resources, um, and help us get more efficiencies that we hadn't thought of before. For instance, a certain, you know, instead of trying to solve a particular disease or symptom, if you could maybe solve the genetic disorder, you know, you, you get multiple birds with one stone, so to speak. You can now solve the various diseases associated with that genetic, genetic disorder. So we're seeing big data uh, being applied to healthcare and, and improving healthcare. Um, you know, LinkedIn, I mentioned, you know, a good example here, um, basically the story was, um, you know, some smart data scientists at LinkedIn noticed that, you know, it's called triangulation, I think is what they called it. But basically, you know, if, if you know Sue and Sally, you know, there was a high correlation that Sue and Sally probably know each other. And so now if folks are on LinkedIn, you're, all, you're always getting these 
these recommendations of people you may know, right? They may not be in your direct network, but because I know Sue and Sally, Sally and Sue probably know each other. Um, so LinkedIn applying these kinds of graph analytics and techniques to um, you know, improve their network and getting you know, their networks bigger and getting folks you know, more engaged on LinkedIn, spending more time on LinkedIn, which allows them to you know, better advertise to you on, on LinkedIn. So those are a couple of industry examples. Now I'd like to transition into um, you know, Intel IT, um, you know, what we're doing with big data. You know, like the previous examples I mentioned, you know, it's pretty well understood how you know, a lot of these social networking companies, LinkedIn, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, et cetera, are using big data to basically improve um, their ability to sell to you. So the question and challenge for us, and similar to the state is, well, how can enterprises take advantage of this, right? Um, and that's what we set out to do, is to see how can we also harness this capability to improve our business. And you know, similarly, like, like I mentioned in the, earlier at the beginning of the talk, then you know, for this audience, how can this state also take advantage of this? So before I dive into that, it probably first behooves me to describe a little bit about you know, Intel and Intel IT um, in particular. So you know, we're a large enterprise. We have over 100,000 employees um, spread across 63 countries uh, all over the world, 164 sites. Um, we have 6,500 IT employees um, across 59 sites, right? So we have a challenge and task in supporting all of this. Um, we have about 68 data centers, um, something less now than 75,000 servers that we manage, um, 150,000 connected systems, 40,000 handheld devices. Um, so, you know, you know, similar to the state, I think the state has over 200,000 um, employees, um, but, you know, large enterprise, we're a large enterprise and, and a lot of challenges that go with that. So with that, you know, th there's a couple of things that IT has to do, right? And this is a slide that we use to kind of share, you know, what all of us, all 6,500 of us in, in IT at Intel aspire to do. You know, the basic, right, at the bottom there, it starts with delivering services, right? You know, we, that, that reason to exist, that transactional relationship. Um, you know, if something's not working, you know, fix it, right? That's, you know, that's the blocking and tackling, you know, role of IT. But what makes IT really exciting to be in these days, right, is those two areas. Because, you know, in the past, IT was kind of limited to that, right? My email's not working, fix it, or my computer doesn't work, fix it. But, you know, the reason why IT is so exciting now is because IT, we, more than ever, have the ability to not only, you know, contribute value, but really transform the businesses or the operations that, that we're a part of. So the contributing value, right, through things like big data, we're able to influence product roadmaps. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do at Intel IT is use big data to help us get to market faster. How can we design and test and manufacture our processors faster to get to market faster? These all have top line revenue impacts for the company. It's not just about cost cutting bottom line savings, but it's about um, getting to market faster and improving the top line. And then that, that transformation, right, to use big data to transform the way we do business. You know, a great example of this is as we, you know, um, enter into system on chip markets, you know, we, you know, we, we, can't, we can't still use these traditional, you know, the old cadences of Moore's Law every 12 to 18 months, a new product out. You know, we need to deliver new products every six months. And, you know, big data is a way for us, a tool to help us get there and achieve some of those goals. So some of the five key strategic initiatives for us in IT, um, you know, consumerization is a, is a key area for us, cloud computing, security, of course, always um, a key focus area. BI, or big data, is, is, is a strategic initiative, as well as um, collaboration. Um, you know, obviously, the, the purpose, the focus of the talk today is around BI and big data. You know, collaboration is another good emerging area for us. You know, Intel, we are a global company, so that has its own challenges. Um, getting f our engineers to collaborate with each other. We have design teams, you know, all over the world. How do they collaborate better? And it's not just, you know, that obvious problem of how do you have your workforce or your engineers collaborate better across country boundaries or across oceans even. But, um, you know, even um, within the same office, right, we find that sometimes an engineer, he'll be working, you know, in the next row or aisle over to another engineer, and instead of getting up and talking, 
you know, he'll send an email, right? Um, so, you know, how do we improve, you know, that kind of collaboration too? But, um, but you know, even things like, you know, things like blogging and information sharing, right? It, it, it's, it's a challenge. You know, there was a, a saying that if only IBM knew what IBM knew, meaning that, you know, there's so much information within a company, how do you share that information? And how do you get folks um, access to that information to help them do their jobs better? So let me start with our journey. And, you know, the purpose of this, I'm sharing this um, with the intent that, you know, if there are folks in this room here who are also just now embarking or starting on this big data journey, um, you know, you can, you know, see how we did it, what we did, and, you know, and, and apply some of these key learnings um, or do things, you know, even better than, than how we did it. But we started back in 2010, and, and I'll go through, go through it. But, but we started first, right, with priorities, right? We wanted to make sure that, you know, we applied big data to areas that actually mattered to our business. So when you look at Intel, right, when you boil it all down, you know, we have over 100,000 employees, you know, all over the world. Really, we only do three things, right? We design processors, we manufacture them, and we sell and market them. You know, that fundamentally is what every employee is, 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 is working on. And so with big data, we wanted to make sure that when we started this, because there was a lot of hype around this, and there was a lot of healthy skepticism even internally, Right, we weren't just gonna go chase a new technology or a new tool just because there was a lot of buzz around it. But we wanted to make sure that this was something that could actually solve problems. Because at the end of the day, we are an IT shop with a finite IT budget. Like Carlos was mentioning, some of the similarities. We have a fixed finite budget. And if we're gonna invest in big data, um, you, know, it's, you have to make trade-offs. So it was important to us to make sure that we impacted those three key areas of our business. You know, the strategy then, you know, how do we go build this out? And so we built out a 16-node Hadoop cluster. Um, I can share details on that. But we wanted to build out this platform so that we can start, you know, applying these um, use cases and getting value out of it. And, you know, the approach we took is to start small. Um, you know, we had this mantra. It was this equation. It was 5 plus 6 equals 10. Um, and what that refers to is no more than five people, five engineers, no longer than six months, um, on a use case that you know, delivered about $10 million back to the corporation. We didn't want anything longer or bigger, even in terms of ROI, because we didn't want to get into these um, projects, these never-ending projects that had no value. And so we used that as our guideline on which projects to pursue and which ones to ZBB or, or, or not pursue. And lastly, the business value, right? So, you know, be making sure that we could show business value, that these weren't just cool, like, science projects to go do, you know, in your garage or something, but this actually did have impact. And we were able to prove this out. Um, we did a couple of uh, projects that, um, you know, delivered on that promise. And now, you know, we're being challenged to go find the $100 million opportunities for Intel. So a little bit more specifically here, I mentioned kind of the strategy, the approach that we took. You know, here's kind of the journey and some of the steps that we took to get there. Um, you know, like I said, it actually started in 2010 um, with our centralized data management, but, you know, big data in particular, 2011, um, where we had to define and deploy a lot of our technology to get our infrastructure up and running. And then, you know, 2013 is where we really started, you know, we, we had some use cases done early on. We started adding to those use cases across our um, business units. So things like everything from sales and marketing to our software and services group to even IT. Um, you know, one of my favorite use cases um, is a use case that we deployed, you know, internally for IT um, across security or manufacturing and, and even in terms of HR and, and talent acquisition. So the fact that we started small, able to demonstrate, prove out the value, now we're adding on more and more projects. Okay, so, you know, these are just three use cases I wanted to highlight. And, you know, I've got a little Dilbert cartoon towards the end, um, but to illustrate this point of personalization, and, you know, one of the big promises of big data is that it allows you to target and personalize some of your efforts. So we developed a contextual recommendation engine. Um, you know, basically what this was, was using, you know, um, mapping technologies to better deliver personalized, um, you know, ads to consumers. And this was a, a new top line revenue stream for Intel, um, you know, based off of an acquisition that we did. So an example of IT 
um, adding top line revenue uh, potential for the company. So basically, the way this worked was, um, you know, if you're a user and you're entering in a destination to go to into your map, your GPS device, you know, it'll t tell you the shortest route or the route to take with the least amount of traffic. But along the way, there'll be various points of interest, right? You know, coffee shops or restaurants or something that you might want to stop in for. And using various factors, like even things like the time of day, the weather outside, what time of year it was, you know, if it was winter and cold, we weren't going to send coupons for ice cream, you know, things like that, to better target, you know, coupons and offers to users um, based on where they were going. And, you know, through the studies we did, you know, we found measurable, you know, improvement and uptick in the ability to, and users actually clicking on some of these coupons and offers, you know, good for the consumer. They're getting offers that they care about, that they can use, good for businesses and retailers who are trying to advertise, and, you know, just better overall, right? So being able to really deliver that personalized experience. Incident predictability. So this is that um, example, my, um, that I mentioned. And basically what this was about, the reason why I like this is so many different levels. You know, one is because, you know, we used a lot of unstructured text analytics. You know, that's, you know, one aspect of big data. We then merged that with, um, you know, traditional kind of, you know, transactional uh, data. And we did all of this to, you know, lower costs for Intel and deliver better user experiences. So, so here's what this is about. It started when, you know, Intel IT, you know, we had this goal. Every time an Intel employee calls in, TAC is what we call it, the Technical Assistance Center, for help with their PC or machine, either, you know, the machine's blue screened or an application won't open, an email application or a web browser application, whatever it may be, you know, users, you know, if, if they do call in to TAC for help, that generates automatically a $30, you know, ticket to Intel um, as we outsource our, um, you know, compute um, servicing for our employees. So we wanted to reduce those costs. So how could we do that? One of the th ways that we, you know, we could do that is that, you know, every 24 hours, every machine, every employee's machine um, uploads a list of events that happen on that machine that day. So all the things that, you know, happen, through the, throughout, happen to your PC or anomalies like things not opening, applications not opening, malware intrusions, et cetera, et cetera, all of that is, is, is uploaded. And so you can imagine over 100,000 employees every day, all this data being uploaded in, it's a large amount of data, right? A challenge to store, let alone analyze. You know, separately, you know, we'd have users, right, who would call in, right? And they would, you know, speak in words as, as humans do. They would say things like, my computer has a blue screen or this application won't open, et cetera. And what we wanted to do is then take that text, you know, apply things like word rooting, word stemming, you know, text analytics to boil things down to the, you know, the, the real meaning, merge that with weblog data, which is unstructured data that the machines were sending in every 24 hours, and merge those things, tie those two things together to understand correlations, right? What are certain events that lead up to an actual event, to a machine going down, right? L resulting in lost productivity, and even resulting in that $30 call, right, for, for help. And so we were able to, you know, come up with a 0.78 correlation between incidents and events, which now helps us to predict, you know, failures before they actually happen. Saving employees time and frustration, saving Intel IT, that, that ticket cost, and, you know, goodness all around. So, you know, really exciting stuff. And now that stuff can be applied, you know, in a lot of different areas. You know, Karen and I, we were talking last night, you know, even what she's trying to do with that, with health services, with um, physicians, and, you know, being able to, you know, measure, you know, physicians to be able to see how they, you know, compare against their peers, to see where the anomalies are and the outliers are, and, you know, to help, you know, eliminate waste and fraud and, you know, overbilling, et cetera. You know, that's great stuff. As a citizen and constituent of California, you know, I love to hear that. So you, so you guys are doing some great work, and there's similarities here as well. So this stuff can be applied you know, across sectors, across industries. And what's similar, the theme, again, is about merging unstructured data with structured data and, you know, being able to predict things that will happen so you can take preemptive action, right? It all ties back to that theme. And that's kind of, you know, the, the promise, that, that's the core of the promise of big data. And then thirdly here, this last example is a sales and marketing example. So what we're trying to do here, you know, very similar, a very similar theme and concept, is, you know, we've always been able to capture transactions very well, right? Um, OLTP, it's been around for a long time. So no, no, nothing, you know, big and impressive there. So we understand, 
you know, when a customer makes a purchase and we're able to fulfill that order, right? We've been doing that for a long time. What we wanted to do with this use case is understand all of the behaviors that lead up to a purchase. So for example, you know, maybe it starts by a customer, you know, watching a webinar online off of intel.com, or maybe even watching this thing right here. And then after they watch this webinar or this event or conference, maybe they then come back to the website and they download a white paper or two. And maybe after that, they then decide to download a reference architecture um, paper. And now they're ready to design in our processors into their, into their design. So just as an example, right, there are various steps that occur before that actual purchase is being made. And all those steps before, we weren't tracking or we couldn't. Right? Now we can. Now that we can, we want to merge those two things, merge that transaction with all that behavior to help us you know, sell more or sell sooner. And this applies across sectors and, uh, and, and industries. And then I um, you know, just want to also tie into a point I made earlier, you know, that one size doesn't fit all. Um, you know, we used to have in the first column, the enterprise data warehouse, this one size fits all, everything was in our, was in our EDW. Um, now we've added new data warehouses and new containers. We have our Hadoop platform that I mentioned. Um, we also have a massively parallel processing platform, the Extreme Data Warehouse. Um, we're also evaluating and doing POCs around in-memory databases for those workloads. And we still have our traditional independent, you know, SQL relational databases that are out there. And so it is very important that we, you know, that, you know, we acknowledge and realize that, you know, Hadoop is not the answer for everything, right? You do need a tailored, customized approach so that you have the right data in the right place at the right time for the right workload. And, uh, you know, this is from a white paper, actually, that um, I co-authored, and it's off of, um, you know, intel.com slash IT, a lot of good resources there, or you can, you know, reach out to me on Twitter. Happy to share this. Um, it, it, it's all public. So now I want to transition into the third and last part of the presentation, um, the call to action, right? You know, so maybe some ideas, hopefully inspire you guys or offer some real concrete, um, you know, actions to, to pursue. So, you know, I, I thought this Dilbert cartoon illustrates it well. I'll give you guys a chance to, to read it um, in case you can. Basically, the, the pointy-haired boss says, you know, we've got all, we've got this big database with all this customer information. You know, Dilbert says, excellent, I can do nonlinear math regressions and all this advanced data mining to optimize the retail channels. And the pointy-haired boss says, well, you, you mean spam, right? <laughs> the reason why this is funny is because, you know, spam has been a wrong, Spam has been around a long time, right? Longer than any of us care to admit. What big data allows us to do is the opposite of spam, right? It goes back to that personalization that I talked about, right? Being able to deliver personalized, relevant, pertinent, you know, ads versus just this broad brush of, you know, of spam. And, you know, Pam Lane talked about it um, earlier this morning. When you look at the data scientists, you look at the various different roles, right? You look at First of all, from a, from a business perspective, the different roles of business, operations, systems, and technologies, and then under that, the, the people, right? Everything from the, from the CXO all the way down to the program manager, to the project manager, to the data solutions, software, hardware, architect, to the you know, database analyst, all the way at the other extreme. You know, really, that data scientist spans a majority of those roles, right? Everything from the business operations manager to the software developer, being able to code. And you know, that's what's really important in making all of this is not possible without people at the end of the day. And you know, someone asked me, you know, how, well, you know, hopefully at the end of the talk, how do you make this tangible? Like how can you, you know, this is just you know, a list, I uh, you know, don't have time to go through all of these, but a list of some of the tools and skills that are needed to you know, make some of this stuff you know, happen. And it, the good news is, is that you know, it's all out there, it's all available. You know, the industry and the ecosystem is more mature than ever to, to get started. So, um, you know, it's easier now than it was back in 2010, 2011. Um, you know, again, getting to, into specifics. Uh, you know, I know when I'm in your shoes and I'm listening to these keynotes, I always, you know, get a little frustrated when things are too high level. But just wanted to, I mean, there's about 30 here. A couple of, you know, a list of, you know, actual practices, data science practices that are out there. And then what I want to do here in red is just kind of highlight maybe, you know, eight or nine um, 
you know, areas that could be relevant for the state, for the folks in this audience. Everything from you know, the personalization that I talked about to weblog, mining on the left-hand side, to things like uh, visualization, you know, being able to use graph search and organize networks and things like trending, regression analysis, whether you're trying to predict population growth in the state um, or you know, trying to model you know, water to, for, for resource planning. You know, these are all things that can be done with the intent you know, here at the bottom in, in the box to improve constituent experiences and to you know, streamline government operations. So I wanted to tie it back again. Um, you know, yeah, I started with the slide a little bit earlier, but you know, these departments, you know, and, and this is not by any means, uh, you know, I, I don't claim to know, know it all, but just my thoughts, uh, you know, where I, what departments specifically I think could you know, benefit from these edge analytics, distributed computing um, analytics. And so, you know, the, the point of this again is that, you know, the democratization of big data, right? It's no longer restricted or limited to, you know, those large entities that have access to tremendous compute, right? Now, you know, the beauty of this is that you can do this across commodity two socket servers. That's how we're doing it. That's how Google does it, you know, and everyone has commodity two socket servers in their enterprise. Um, some more examples uh, pertaining to you know, government. You know, here's a you know, smart traffic intelligent transport system. Actually, Intel has been working pretty closely with the government of China to um, you know, institute a smart city to you know, help both improve traffic flow as well as um, you know, crime um, as well. So you know, here's what they're doing, um, predictive traffic analytics. They're using HBase embedded into cameras. Um, you know, the, resulting in two billion HBase records, petabytes of traffic data, um, and they're also helping to, you know, through cameras, you know, ID fake licenses in less than a minute, you know, going back to that real time the, the, and, and the velocity nature of things. So, you know, here's examples, you know, I've got another example here of Germany, um, what they're trying to do with their smart traffic management system. Um, you know, same idea, right? And here they're trying to have cars communicate with each other and even with traffic lights. So what's really cool about this is that, you know, nowadays most traffic lights are LED based, right? And because they're LED based, they can communicate, right? And so now you can do things like, not only can traffic lights, you know, be able to see and sense traffic and congestion, but, you know, eventually we want to get to a place where a traffic light is smart enough, right? It has the computing in it to maybe even be able to see that there's a car coming that it looks like they're not gonna stop, that they're gonna speed past a yellow or even speed past a red and communicate that to you maybe approaching. So even though you may be seeing a green signal, you know, it can communicate to your car to be like, you know, hey, slow down, this car is coming and they don't look like they're gonna stop. So being able to apply those kinds of things to even save lives are you know, incredibly important. It's important to Intel as a company. You know, one of the things that we are trying to do um, is make every device smart and and in doing so, and not only smart, but able to communicate to help improve our lives. So this is something that Intel is passionate about and, and we're trying to help with. You know, healthcare. Um, I know you guys have already started it um, uh, along this path, but you know, big data, it's not just, there's so many different aspects of healthcare that big data can apply. Everything from the R&D side of it, the life sciences to clinical operations, right, which can you know, save providers, insurance companies money and even things to accounting and pricing, which can help save us, consumers of healthcare money as well. So there is a lot of you know, waste in the system, you know, even fraud, things like that. And that's not good for anyone. So you know, the fact that you know, we can use big data to address these, to solve some of these, that's just good for everyone. So to summarize, I think I'm running out of time here. Um, you know, really three key messages, right? You know, one, you know, it's possible now, easier than ever, right, to build a cost-effective, versatile big data platform, right? And also knowing, you know, you know, one size does not fit all. You know, there's a lot of, you know, hype around Hadoop. You know, it, it does hold a lot of promise. There's no question about it. I believe that, um, but it's not the answer for everything. Um, you know, eventually it may be the answer for most things, and that's actually something that, that Intel IT is looking at as well, is how do we, you know, maybe migrate more and more of those other containers onto Hadoop, which is, you know, cheaper. Um, you know, secondly, it's, you know, technology is important, right? Um, but skills are essential, right? So developing your people and your workforce, I mean, without that, you know, nothing can happen. And, you know, lastly, you know, on a, on a positive note, you know, the ecosystem, it, it's more mature than ever. 
and it's um, and as a result easier than ever to get started. So, you know, hopefully you guys got some ideas on things to go do and can get started. Um, you know, with as little obstacles as possible. So, you know, in conclusion, you know, big data analytics has led to big value across you know every sector, public, private, every vertical. Um, and then this is the last slide. Just for more resources, I know this is just a keynote talk, but go to intel.com slash IT. Um, a lot of white papers, you know, we do a lot of these studies. We want to share this with the world. I've co-authored some of these. We have tools and calculators, videos, um, blogs, you name it. And also happy to um, engage on Twitter if anyone has any questions. Let's keep the dialogue going. Um, you can see my Twitter handle there um, at the bottom. So, uh, thank you. Thank you.